Pygmalion and Galatea, scene three. Pygmalion had to pull Galatea's body through a subterranean crouchway to reach their intended destination, a sea cave with a collapsed roof. Throughout the abbreviated journey, he was forced to lay her down onto the bare ground for the sake of clearing away recent breakdown or simply wiping away beads of sweat from his forehead. It was uncharacteristically warm for a midwinter's day, muggy even. He could feel the thickness and humidity that pervaded the air as it filtered through his lungs, sapping his reserves of strength and warping a modestly difficult task so that it now appeared Herculean. The sudden incline in the terrain was bothersome, but in no way was it insuperable. Grunting like an Olympic competitor going through the motions of a difficult clean and press, Pygmalion pulled Galatea through the crouchway and into the canyon with one fluid no motion. He managed to stand her up against the flowstone without scraping her against any brittle rocks and issued an extended sigh of relief. Exhausted by his overland and subterranean excursion, he dropped to his knees near the cave mouth and splashed seawater onto his face. This better be worth it, he gasped, for your sake. It will be. Did you see everyone gawking back at the beach? asked Pygmalion. Well, it's not as if you're a food host wholesaler wheeling cheese and eggs into a retail store, said Galatea. What you just did is quite left of the middle. People are going to stare. I should have at least covered you with a cloth. If you did, I wouldn't have been able to see where I was going, said Galatea. You keep forgetting that the simulacrum enables my physical senses. Right, said Pygmalion. What's in here that I just had to see? Look to my right, said Galatea. Can you see the fossilized clams on the floor near the crouchway? Yeah. Test them for vibratory rates, said Galatea, with a pendulum. Pygmalion withdrew the brass pendulum from his pocket and held it over each of the fossils, adjusting the length of the string until it began gyrating. Then he counted the number of revolutions. What do you have? asked Galatea. They all react to the 14 inch rate, said Pygmalion. Some also respond to the 24 inch and 29 inch rates. 14 is silica, so that's to be expected, said Galatea. The other two denote male and female. That's odd. Why? Well, the animals that lived in these shells have been dead for thousands, if not millions of years, haven't they? More like a hundred million, said Galatea, so yeah. How does it know what sex these organisms were when they died? Asked Pygmalion. That shouldn't be possible, right? Not according to science it shouldn't, said Galatea, yet here it is. So correct me if I'm wrong, said Pygmalion, but the pendulum actually reacts to an energy or radiation of some sort that has survived beyond death or beyond the organism's physical death, and exists independent of time. That's right, said Galatea. The field continues to exist as long as the matter does. Quite literally, in fact. Didn't the ancient Egyptians believe that the soul could only return to the corporeal plane if the physical shell remained intact? The history of each object or substance is literally transcribed in the field around it. I know, we tested heaps of things yesterday in the yard. I mean, we have individual rates, for plants, metals, substances, foods, vegetables, animals. We even have rates for thoughts, qualities, and intangible principles. Go on. I'm not going to deny that there's a congruent pattern in the rates. I think that's clearer than glass acrylic. Yet you don't believe what it's telling you about survival. Well, no, I uh, know. I mean, yes, I do, said Pygmalion, staring at the clamshells. I just can't seem to jettison the absurdity of the implications. You're definitely a conservative, said Galatea. Isn't all science supposed to be based on observation, Pygmalion? Yeah, but... Galatea chuckled. Only when it sugarcoats the existing theories, hey? I didn't say that. You don't agree with it because it seriously challenges the established conventions, she said. That's all. No, Galatea. I think we're living, or you're living, I should say, in an age where science has usurped the antipathies of dogmatic religion. We've come a long way since the days of bonfires and mud huts, said Pygmalion. Give us some credit. It's true, but there's no shortage of theories that presume to measure and reflect the nature of being, said Galatea. They do. No, they don't, she rebutted. A correct theory prompts new insights and truths and attracts to itself supporting evidence 
with the passage of time in the manner that a credible academic authority will eventually gain the respect, admiration and support of the general public, does it not? Sure, Pygmalion nodded. Theories are like snowballs that increase in size by rolling down the slope of a snow-capped mountain. Great analogy, said Galatea, but that's definitely not the case with what is learned about the nature of being at schools and universities today. Take psychiatry, for instance. It's a science, a medical specialty, no more than about 200 years of age, that pigeonholes bundled up psychological impulses under the address of mental illness, stripping people of dignity and self-respect in the process. It keeps categorizing, putting names and labels on emerging so-called mental disorders without the slightest idea of how it might cure them. What does that tell you about psychiatry, Pygmalion? You can pretty much put your precious Darwinism in the same boat. Well, like it or not, that's where we're at. That's where you shouldn't be at, Galatea pushed on. It's like you're being led astray by medieval demons masquerading as angels. For a while now, scientists have been coming to the table with one-dimensional paradigms, perimeters and programs which they strap on the limbs of the planet in hope of satisfactorily answering the eternal question of how and why. Then, when things don't go quite the way they expected or don't work out at all, they either blame the instruments themselves or go on scratching the scalp of their heads until the skin flakes off. It will never ever occur to most of them that the founding principles on which the skeletal framework of their science rests is an illusion, a desert mirage. That would be too much of an ego bruiser, said Pygmalion. Exactly the root of the problem, I say, said Galatea. Heaven forbid if someone else stole the spotlight or sat on the throne of egotistical posterity or came up with a viable theory that could be validated. That would be a complete disaster for the competing ego. Could you imagine? Most people are wired that way, said Pygmalion. It can't be helped, I'm afraid. You mean most guys are wired that way, exclaimed Galatea. Get over it, I say. The cosmos is far more majestic than the monocular self-importance and righteousness indigenous to the pea-sized, pea-headed human ego. I don't disagree with you, said Pygmalion, but fighting the oscillations of human nature is like paddling against a very powerful current. Sadly, the courageous few that have dared to didn't get all that far. All I'm saying is that people are simply not looking at life as it should, must, and deserves to be looked at, said Galatea. Probably. Look, I'll show you something. Galatea stepped out of her clay shell and dropped to her knees. She aligned the palms vertically with the ground. What on earth are you doing? asked Pygmalion. 